All right, so a vector is kind of like a ray. If you remember rays from geometry, they have, you're done. Yeah. They have an endpoint and an arrow, and that's what the difference is with vectors. They have two endpoints, but there's still an arrow. And the arrow just shows you the direction in which the vector is heading. So there is an initial point, which is your dot where it starts. There's a terminal point where it stops, and then there's an arrow to show you which one's which, okay? Because usually they're not labeled. Like, you're not going to get a thing that says initial point and terminal point on a graph. You'll see the two endpoints and an arrow, and that arrow is pointing towards the terminal point, which means where does it stop, okay? So there's two characteristics of this vector. There is direction and length. So direction is kind of like slope, if you can think about it, change in X and change in Y. Um, and then length, obviously, the distance from one point to the other. There's two ways to name a vector. One is by its initial point, its terminal point, with this little like half arrow kind of guy on top. So that PQ is vector PQ. The arrow goes over the terminal point. And then the other way to name it is with one single lowercase bolded letter. So it'll either be bolded or italicized in your notes, you'll see, or in your book. But it's usually lowercase. So I could either call this vector PQ, or I could call it vector V. There's just two, two different ways to name them. Probably more commonly by the lowercase letter, you'll see. So the first thing we're gonna learn about a vector is component form, and component form is the change in X, followed by the change in Y. So it's kind of like slope, except it's not written, written as a ratio, and you do the X first. It's also different from slope because the order is important. In slope, it doesn't matter which one you pick to be y1 and y2 because the negatives in the top and the bottom will balance each other out. But because these are separate, it's important to make sure that you do the terminal minus the initial. So it's the terminal x minus the initial x comma, the terminal y minus the initial y. And the way you'll write the component form would be something like this. So it will be two numbers separated by a comma. And these brackets are not parentheses, so be really careful. Parentheses imply a point. This says that I started somewhere and my x changed two units to the right and my y changed three units up. So that's not a point. The second piece of information that you'll get from initial and terminal is the magnitude. So the length of a, of a vector can be found two different ways. If you have both the initial and the terminal point, then you can use the distance formula to find the length, which is the square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. Or if you already have the component form, then there's a shortcut, and sometimes you're not given initial and terminal, you're only given the component form, and that's the square root of a squared plus b squared. This should be a double, it's like an absolute value bar, but there's, oops. There should be two of them. That's how you show magnitude. So if I just gave you V equals, that means it's in component form. If I gave you V inside those double um, brackets, that means it's the magnitude or the length of uh, vector V. Questions so far? Anybody still copying? Okay. Component form would be like this. And then the double V, this is saying magnitude. So the, the, number, the letter by itself is component form, and then in double bra brackets is the length or the magnitude. Equivalent vectors, okay, if you think about equivalent, remember, equals, okay. These are vectors that have the same magnitude and the direction. So they have the same length and the same change, y, change in X and change in Y. Same magnitude, same component form. You can have the same magnitude with a different component form because when you square it, like one could be positive, one negative, but not the other way around. So if I had like the square root of negative three squared plus negative two squared, I would get the same answer as if I had three squared plus two squared, right? Those would be the same. So magnitude can match without component matching. So you wanna be careful. 
All right, so this says show that U is equal to V. So you're showing that these are equivalent. I'm gonna adjust this picture real fast because you gotta be able to change. So this should actually be a terminal point here. There should be a point at the end there. And at the beginning, I mean, it's kind of there, but those should be end points. And then the same for up here. That should be a point. So these are two vectors. One is u and one is v. So we're gonna go through the motions of component form and magnitude for each. So the component form of u, my initial point here is zero, zero. So it'd be the second x, or the terminal x, and again, I know that because of the arrow, the direction the arrow's going, which would be two minus the initial one, which is zero, and then three is the terminal y minus the initial one, which is zero. So the component form of u is two, three. And then the magnitude of u, and I'll show you both ways, but obviously the second's gonna be shorter. I could do the square root of two minus zero squared plus three minus zero squared, which is the square root of two squared, plus three squared, square root of four, plus nine, which is the square root of 13. So that's using the distance formula. The shortcut is the square root of a squared plus b squared. So if you already have the component form, which we found first, two squared plus three squared, square root of four plus nine, which is square root 13. And that's the magnitude of u. And it doesn't matter which one you use. Sometimes you already, sometimes you only have the component form, so you'd be forced to use a shortcut. But if you had both initial and terminal, then it's totally up to you. Okay, so that's u. Now I gotta find the same thing for v. So component form of V would be the second X, terminal X, which is negative two, minus the initial one, minus the negative four is plus four, terminal Y, which is negative one, minus the negative four, which is plus four. And I get two, three. And then the magnitude of V, those are the same numbers, square root of two squared, plus three squared, square root of four plus nine, which is 13. So because the actual directions said, show that they are equivalent, you could have assumed they were equivalent from the beginning and your work is your answer. If the question was, are they equivalent, then you're answering yes or no. Question so far. All right, we're just gonna do A. So this says find the component form and magnitude of vector V. So go ahead, find the initial, there's the initial in the terminal. Find the component form and the magnitude, which is what we just did. All right, so you should have gotten component form is 16, seven, and your terminal, I mean, sorry, and your magnitude is the square root of 305. So the test will most likely, I haven't made it yet, but the most likely will be done in two parts, like calculator, non-calculator, obviously six, one and six, two, you need your calculators for. There's a couple of things and vectors you need your calculators for, but then something like this could be on the non-calculator portion. So if that's the case, you wanna make sure that you give your answer for magnitude in simplified radical form. So if 305 was able to be simplified, I would. If not, like it isn't, then you would keep it as the square root of 305. So we assume equal and Yes. All right, then you've got something called a scalar multiple. So a scalar multiple is how you would change the length of a vector, okay? You take it and you make it longer, you make it shorter. It does not change the direction of it. So K, which is what represents the scalar multiple, is just a real number other than zero. 
So it could be something like two, it could be something like a half, or it could be something like negative three halves. Those are all real numbers, okay? Two means I'm doubling the length, that's all. So if you actually had vectors, so like if you look at the ones on the bottom, this V, if I doubled it, would be this to this, okay? So two V should be twice the length of V, but the direction is still the same. If I cut it in half, then it should look something like it's half its length. When you look at negative three halves, then the three halves means one and a half its length, right? So it looks like it's about one and a half its length. What is that negative doing to your vector? Changing the direction. So that if I was moving right and up, I'm now moving either left or, and up or right and down. One way or the other, I'm switching the direction. So where the arrow is coming up in all of these, if it's negative, it changes direction if it was pointing down, then negative would point it up, okay? It's gonna change the direction on your, um, on your vector. Vector addition and scalar multiples. So these are all the things that you can do with vectors. So if I started with, so this is what you're starting with. If I started with vector u, which would be u1, u2, vector v, which is v1, v2, and k, which is a scalar, again, a real number, any number, then I can add the two vectors by combining both the first terms and both the second terms. I can subtract the vectors by doing the first minus the first and the second minus the second in whatever order it's given to me in. And I can multiply by a scalar by simply distributing in that value to both terms of my component form. And I can change the direction by multiplying by a negative. So you can take that negative and put it in on both terms, or you could take it back out with the same thing. So the good news is this is a lot of arithmetic. This is adding and subtracting numbers and multiplying numbers. This part is not difficult. This is where stupid mistakes are made, so just be careful, okay? You just gotta know what to do when you start. All right, then you're gonna get asked to sketch a vector. So when you sketch a vector, if you're given the component form, remember the first term is the change in x and the change in y. If you are given both initial and terminal, you can plot your initial, plot your terminal, connect them. That's super easy. If you weren't given initial, then you're assuming your initial is 0, 0, and then using your terminal as the stopping point. Okay? So a vector can be drawn in a coordinate plane, but it also can float around on that coordinate plane and still exist as a vector because your change in x and change in y would still be the same, and your magnitude would still be the same. All right, so this one says, find A, U plus V, B, U minus V, and 2, U minus 3, V. So we're going to first find them, and then I'll go through and graph them. So the first one is A, U plus V. So I'm going to add the two U's. Actually, change this. Change this to 2, 4, because it's confusing that they're the same number. So the two U or the two the two initial terms would be two plus one. And then the two second terms in each would be four plus three. So I'd get three seven for U plus V. Then I'm gonna do U minus V. So this time I do the first minus the first and the second minus the second. And obviously order is important there. If that said V minus U, that would be reversed. So this becomes one, one. Everybody with me so far? Okay, and then the last one, C, two U minus three V. I'll show you two different ways to do it. The first way, Find 2u and 3v separately. So 2u is 2 times 2, 4, which is 4, 8. Then find 3v, which is 3 times 1, 3, or 3, 9. And then subtract them. So 4 minus 3. 8 minus 9, which is negative 4, or sorry, 
1, negative 1. The other way to do it is kind of just distribute that in. So I would do 2 times 2, 4, minus 3 times 1, 3. And then distribute it in, so it'd be 4, 8, plus a negative 3, 9. And then combine your terms. Either way, you get the same answer. So whether you keep the negative in the front and, and distribute the 3 and then subtract, or you distribute the negative 3, it's totally up to you. Just be careful. Make sure you do one or the other, not both. All right, everybody with me so far? All right, so now we're going to graph these. So I'm going to use a coordinate plane to graph them, but it doesn't mean these exist only on this coordinate plane. I, these can float all around that coordinate plane, okay? Because I don't know an initial and a terminal. I only have the change in. So when I go to do A, I'm going to start at 0, 0. And my change in x is 3, so I'm going to the right. 3, 1, 2, 3. And my change in y is 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And my arrow goes in the direction of where I stopped. So that would be u plus v for 3, 7. Then I go to do b which is 1, 1. So I'd start at 0, 0, and I'd stop at 1, 1. And again, my arrow goes in the direction of where I stopped. And then C, so this must be, C is 1, negative 1. So I start at 0, 0, I go to the right one, and I go down one. And this time the arrow points to where I stopped, which is the bottom right. So the only thing I really use the coordinate grid is to get the slope and the point, but technically these, these um, vectors can exist anywhere on that coordinate plane as long as they are the same distance and they point in the same direction. Sarah. because you don't have an initial point. So if I had an initial and a terminal, I would use those two. But if you don't have an initial, you have to start at zero, zero, and then go to where you stop. Actually, you could start anywhere you wanted to, as long as you go in the direction that you need to, and you stop at your magnitude. Questions so far? So everything that we did in terms of component form is also done in something called linear form or a linear combination, which is in terms of i and j. So the i goes behind the number that is your change in x, and the j goes behind the number that is your change in y. Think i comes before j, x comes before y, okay? So everything we do in terms of component form can be rewritten in terms of i, j. So these two will be used interchangeably. So if I had component form, let's say two, negative three, then in ij format or in linear form, it would be 2i minus 3j. If the question is given to you in component form, you want to answer your answers in component form. If it's given to you in linear form with the ij, you need to answer it in terms of the ij. If the ij throws you, immediately pull it out and put it back in a component form. It doesn't matter. Again, interchangeable. Everything we do in linear form, we can also do in component form and vice versa. So whatever's in front of the i is your change in X or your A, whatever's in front of the J, is your change in Y or your B. So same set of instructions, but now the information is given to you in a different format. It says find U plus V, U minus V, and 2U minus 3V. So I'll show you the first thing you can do is take it out of IJ format, but sometimes it's easier to leave it in it, to be honest, because you're just combining like terms. So I'll show you both. Like if I needed to, take it out of ij format and put it back into component form, what would 3i plus j be? 3, 1. And what would 2j be? 0, 2. Everybody understand that? Everybody with me so far? 
Now I can continue through the entire process that we did already. I can add the two terms, three plus zero, which is three, one plus two, which is three. That would be A. B, subtract, so three minus zero is three, one minus two is negative one. And then C, find two, where's the two? Yeah, two U minus three, two. So I would do two times U, which would be six, two, minus three V, which is zero, six, and I'd get six, negative four. So I could walk through that whole process by converting it back into component form and completing it the way we did the first time. Or you can keep it in terms of I and J. So if it's U plus V, then it's 3I plus J plus 2J, and then all I have to do is combine my like terms, 3I plus 3J. This is the <coughs> format you would have then had to put this into. So if it's in component form and your question was in IJ format, you'd have to convert it anyways. This would have been 3I plus 3J. For B, I could do 3I plus J minus 2J, and I'd get 3I minus J, which is what this is. And for C, I could do 2 times U minus 3 times V. So I'd get 6I plus 2J minus 6J or 6I minus 4J, which is the same as this. So in my opinion, it's actually easier to keep it in the IJ format. You're just combining like terms. Okay, but sometimes the IJs freak people out. Take them out. Put it in component form. Just make sure your answer is back in linear format. So your answers needed to be in terms of I and J, no matter which way you did it. Questions so far? All right, unit vector in the same direction. So if it asks you to find another vector in the same direction of the given one, it doesn't want the same vector, so you want to use one that has the same direction but different magnitude. And the way you find it is this formula right here, which is not too complicated. It is just the component form over the magnitude. They will give you the component form, so you'll have the top. You just have to put it over the magnitude and then simplify it. So you're looking again for a vector that's heading in the same direction, but it's not the same magnitude. So it says find the unit vector in the same direction as the given vector and then verify that the result has a magnitude of one. So I'm gonna take U and I'm gonna find from it U over the magnitude of U. So I already have the component form. That's my numerator. Then I have to find the magnitude. So how do I find the magnitude of u? I don't have initial point and terminal point, so I can't do the distance formula, right? Good. So I would do 1 squared plus negative 3 squared. Square root of 1 plus 9, which is square root of 10. So there's two problems with that. What's one of them? Square roots in the bottom, you can't leave it there. Second thing is that is not component form, okay? So what you have to do, and there's two options here, either split it and then simplify it. So if I split it, the one gets the root 10 in the denominator and the negative three gets the root 10 in the denominator. And then rationalize it. So one times root 10 would be root 10 over 10, negative three root 10 over 10. That's one way to do it. The other way is the reverse. Rationalize it and then split it. So if I pull that one over root 10 out to the front and then rationalize it, now I only have to rationalize once and then multiply it out. So now it's like a scalar that would get multiplied by both. Yep. 
either way you get the same answer. So you want to do the component form over the magnitude and then you want to simplify it. So either answer here works, they're both the same. So what should happen, the way you can check these, is if I find the magnitude of this, it should be 1. So if I did the square root of the square root of 10 over 10 squared plus negative 3 root 10 over 10 squared, I get the square root of 10 over 100 plus 3 squared, which is 9 times 10, 90 over 100, 100 over 100 square to one, which is one. So it's a way to check it is the idea behind it, okay? So for B, the only thing you'd have to do is what? What's the difference between A and B? It's in I and J format, so I'd have to take it out first. So this would become negative three, negative four, put it over the magnitude, so negative three squared plus negative four squared, which is five. This time I don't even have to rationalize it. But, because it was given to me in IJ format, it's got to go back to IJ format. And then if I, rash, if I checked it, square root of negative 3 over 5 squared plus negative 4 over 5, I'd get back my 1. 